Welcome to World History 2, Dr. John Chappell, a.k.a. Dr. JC, here in the house. Yes, welcome. We're going to be doing uh, a little bit of foundational work here as it relates to modern history, modern global history, and specifically, at least in this lecture, modern European and Middle Eastern history. So we're going to take a look at the Mongols, the Black Death, and the Ottomans as a way to sort of set the stage and the trajectory for the history of the modern world that will come over the next several lectures and weeks of the course. So let's start with the Mongols then. Because we cover the Mongols as it relates to history, tactics, so on and so forth in the first half of this course, I'm going to focus specifically here on Mongolian impact on Europe, especially Eastern Europe, the Far East, especially China, and then the Near East. So let's start with the Mongolians and their impact on Europe especially Eastern Europe. Mongolian influence in Europe, especially Eastern Europe, is really pretty profound. I mention they're profound because in some sense the Mongols are going to lead to the fracturing or decentralization of some areas. At the same time they're going to lead to the unification or centralization of other areas. As an example of that we can take the Eastern Slavic peoples. Mongol incursions here are going to cause them to break apart, fracture, and eventually they will go on then and create these new, more modern states that we know today, Belarus, the Ukraine, and Russia. And regarding the latter, Russia, while certainly the Vikings, especially from Sweden, helped bring about the rise of Kievan Russia, it would be the Mongols that helped bring about a larger unification of various ethnic peoples into this thing that we would eventually call a Russian Empire. And so in that regard, one could view modern Russia as the byproduct of both Viking and Mongol influence. Thus, as it relates to Russian history, either pretty cool or pretty frightening depending on how one views the Vikings and the Mongols. Before talking about Mongolian influence in the Middle East and then moving on to the Black Death and a brief discussion about the Ottomans, I wanted to talk about Mongolian influence in the Far East, especially in China. While the Mongols had always existed on the fringes of Chinese dynasties, it will be the grandson of Genghis Khan, Kublai Khan, depicted here, that will lead to the creation of the first foreign dynasty in Chinese history, known as the Yuan Dynasty. While Kublai Khan's Yuan Dynasty is going to be very short-lived, it will serve as this bridge between the Song who preceded it and then the Ming and Qing who come behind it, the real impact of Khan here was his openness. And what I mean by that is he was able to, in some sense, break down the walls, pun intended, in China, and open China up to outside influence, especially as it relates to the arts, sciences, mathematics, culture, you name it largely because the Mongols had been traversing much of the known world. And as a result of that, they're able to bring in some cool outside ideas and products. And in a way, he will then influence the Ming and Qing, the last two imperial dynasties in Chinese history, both of which we'll talk a little bit about briefly later in the course. But he's able to influence those through his short-lived reign here. We can start to see then the impact of the Mongols on the future trajectory of history, not just in Europe, but in the Far East here, as already experienced through their impact on Russia and China. But perhaps their greatest impact came in the Middle East. Now, in the previous course, we started to talk about Islam's golden age, Harun al-Rashid, the creation of this Abbasid dynasty, the beginning of this golden age of Islam where Baghdad was the center of all things. They had this grand library, this Bayt al-Hikmah, or House of Wisdom. All that will be brought to an end by the Mongols. Well, you can read here and perhaps do some additional research as to the siege and ultimate destruction of Baghdad. I wanted to take a minute here to talk about the importance of Baghdad to the Mongols. For psychological reasons, again, this was important to the Mongols. Not only was the wealth and power of the Abbasid dynasty destroyed here, but so too was the world's first global religion. Think of the psychological power here. If Allah cannot protect you from us, what power can, whether living or supernatural? This would lead to a sense of Mongolian invincibility, and in a way this is going to be part of their own undoing. And part of that undoing is going to come from technology. 
The Mongols are going to run into the Mamluks here at the Battle of Ain Jalut. And the Mamluks are going to be armed with this thing called a hand cannon. It is a very early version of what we might call a rifled musket. Therefore, on this 3rd of September 12 and 60, while these hand cannon aren't going to kill many Mongolians, they certainly are going to scare the piss out of the Mongolian horses and break up their attack. And as you may well imagine, the rest of the known world is going to want to know what helped defeat the Mongols. Everyone's going to want a hand cannon. While Mongolian decline isn't going to happen overnight, again, these guys are going to be around a couple centuries, it will eventually come, in part because they don't have a capital city. They don't have a place to do research and development, and therefore they're always going to be behind the technological curve. It's a problem. Rather than work through all aspects of their legacy, some of which are listed here on this slide, I want to focus on the last piece here, the idea that perhaps the Black Death was brought to Europe by the Mongols themselves. Whether they carried this knowingly or unknowingly is subject to, in some sense, ad nauseum debate. What we do know, however, from some accounts is that they did understand something was afoot during this siege of the city of Kaffa in 1345 and 1346. Within the Mongol camp itself besieging the city, individuals began to contract some type of disease and within four days, they're gone. Bye bye dead. One can only imagine maybe the thought or fear within the Mongols themselves. Like, woo, okay, we defeated that god Allah in Baghdad, but now we might be up against some different Christian god here in Kaffa, and he's casting like poo-poo spells on us. One can only imagine what they were thinking. At the end of the day, they decided, you know what, discretion's the better part of valor. We're gonna blow this pop stand. We're out of here. Yet prior to leaving, they figured, ah, Let's just go ahead and give them folks a little something something inside the city. And by some accounts, bodies of infected individuals were catapulted over the walls into the city of Kaffa. Does this give us some indication of the first use of biological or germ warfare? Perhaps. But hey, it's the Mongolian way, baby. Always leave them with a little fear and a little doubt. And while the Mongols may have beat feet and retreated, they left behind something much more insidious the Black Death. Over the course of the next four or five years, from roughly about 13 and 46, 47 to 13 and 51, and by the way, this will come back at different points during European history as well, the Black Death. Tens of millions, yes, with an N, millions of Europeans are going to die from this. While numbers are going to vary based on geographic locale, anywhere from 30 to 60 percent of European society is going to die. On a more recent research trip to Norway, while in Bergen, I was at a leprosy museum and I found out there that the population of Norway decreased by 50%. And in fact, it wouldn't be until 1850, 500 years after the Black Death came through, that Norway's population would equal what it was in 1350. Think about that. 500 years for the population to rebound. Imagine the shock across Europe. Now this is part of the feudal age. You're supposed to be protected by your feudal lord or by the Catholic Church. And when this black death rolls through and family members start to die within four days and you approach your feudal lord and ask for help and he shrugs his shoulders. And when you approach the Catholic Church and your local priest can't do anything but shrug his shoulders and not give you any sort of explanation, what are you to think? Maybe what I'll do then is I'll go ahead and pick out one middle finger for you, feudal lord, and the other one you, church, and I'll get an answer myself. I'll look to science and I will look to nature if need be for an answer. But I have family members, I have kids dying, and I need an answer. Thus the Black Death killed lots of people, but it also killed the social order of the day. Feudalism is going to die because of this. People are going to begin to start to look to science and nature, the classics. What did the Greeks and Romans do? So when we talk about the Renaissance or rebirth of Europe later in the course, I want you to remember the Black Death. The Mongolian impact, therefore, on the Near East or Middle East is pretty huge as well. Not only do they bring about the demise of this Abbasid dynasty, which will give rise to the Ottomans, we'll talk about those folks next, but they also help spread this thing, in all likelihood they did anyway, called the Black Death. Holy crap! So the Mongols themselves, hugely transformative, whether intentionally 
or unintentionally. Pretty important to recognize, and I'd ask that you remember that. Because of the importance of the Ottomans, now they're going to be those individuals that are largely going to replace the Abbasids as the sort of cement or power in the Near East or Middle East. Their rule is going to run from 14 and 53 all the way to 1918, the end of World War I. Because of the importance of those folks, and because I'm facing time limits here, I only got about four minutes of taping left, what I'm going to do is I'm going to end this lecture here. We will call this the end of part one for week one. And instead, I'm going to go ahead and create a part two or second lecture that's going to focus specifically on the Ottomans, their rise and their impact especially on Western Europe. Therefore, I'm going to go ahead and say Dr. JC out here from part one, week one. And we'll move next in part two of week one, talking specifically about the Ottomans. So we'll go to the Ottomans next.